Welcome to live stream. I'm Susie Khalil at Kirk Hopper Fine Art in Dallas for the opening of Chaos and Mayhem, Charmaine Locke and James Searles. Before beginning the live stream, we'd like to show a brief video as an introduction to this exhibition. The origin really goes back for 40 plus years. Uh, Charmaine and I have had several shows together over the years. Uh, we were in a show together in California, uh, and we were in a show together in New Orleans. It, I mean, and by that I mean like a two-person show or a show where we both showed with other uh, other people. Um, and we've had shows recently, like maybe 12 years ago, we had a show together in uh, Laramie, Wyoming. It was great. Uh, we had a show together in Corpus Christi before that. Uh, we had a, uh, a show together a couple of years ago at the Colorado Springs Museum. Major museum exhibition of both of our work. Twenty nineteen was a um, that when I started this group of drawings, and as they developed and moved uh, through the first few months of twenty twenty, um, actually James and Susie Khalil were communicating about a magazine that online magazine that she was producing with uh, and through Kurt Copper. You know, I would say that she was the magnet here at Kurt, at Kurt's gallery um, that drew us here. We were ready to be magnetized, to tell you the truth, because we had the body of work. We, everything was in place. All of the psychological verbiage about it, the, uh, the work itself was, was coming together. So it just made total sense, and it was very easy to do in as much as any exhibition is easy to do. The general feeling, which I've talked about in a couple of other uh, video pieces, is the concept of human flourishing. Our culture in 2020 had really reached a peak of excellence and high um, achievement in so many realms. And yet at the same time, there was this feeling and, and emotional tone that things were starting to slip away or erode. And as the pandemic came and it was not being controlled and it was not being, I mean, our death toll rising, vaccines not being, they did come out fairly quickly, but now they're not being uh, distributed as quickly as people would like. I, I, you know, I would be hard pressed to tell you how this will change our future. And I said when, I, when, when at the beginning of this that I thought it would. I thought this was a benchmark. You know, that this exhibition will set the pace for what is to come, you know, futuristically. 
And it's a pretty heavy pace. It's a pretty fast pace. I'm, I'm very excited about this show. I think this exhibition, to tell you the truth, is we could call it a benchmark, we could call it a high water mark, we could, you know, any way you care to describe it in terms of its elevation in our personal world, uh, I think it is. I think this body of work kind of defines a new territory you know, and sets up a new set of circumstances and opens a, a new psychological doorway. And I think that's very, very important. I'm sure it will be a successful show. And um, as the next month goes by and COVID recedes a little bit into the, I hope there will be more people that come through and see the, sh see the exhibit. This discussion is a great opportunity to engage with the artists and the work in terms of a personal and larger critical context. Charmaine is showing her recent anti-war series, 13 large works on paper, including the sculpture Unholy Warrior, and James has eight major wood sculptures plus drawings and prints. It's the most explosive work of their careers. Well, what blew the lid off? The overriding theme here is war or anti-war between countries, races, cultures, religions, the sexes, and one's own body, the public and the private. We never imagined this work would ring of such prophecy. Given the recent events at the Capitol, chaos and mayhem takes on even greater relevance. In 2020, we suffered a global pandemic, systemic racism. What meaning does chaos and mayhem bring? What is this work telling us in an, in an increasingly uncertain future? Charmaine, would you like to take off on this? Well, um, so glad to have everybody here with us today. And um, during 2020, even starting back in 2019, I started feeling a tremor in the ground in our culture and sensing big changes even before the pandemic hit, but then um, exploding with the pandemic. But I started with Chaos and Mayhem, a drawing that directly uh, addressed what we're dealing with, what we're looking at in our culture today. And then I moved to a drawing called Uncivil Wars. Wars are not civil, <laughs> are, nor are they holy. So unholy war, unholy warrior. Battles are part and integral to life. It's the tug of war. It is the back and forth, the positive, negative interplay uh, that we've seen throughout our, for thousands of years. It probably won't end but we do need to find an end to this particular situation, and these drawings are a red alert, red alarm to fact factors taking place in our culture today that we want to corral and bring back into balance. James, would you like to comment on this? <laughs> well, my goodness, <clears throat> it's the subject at hand. It is the subject of our times uh, you know man history has kind of risen and fallen over hundreds and hundreds of years of uh, you know sort of the coming and going of uh, civilizations and wars and internal and external and it's it just has really just come to the forefront you know not since the 60s literally have I seen kind of the the mayhem uh, afoot uh, it's personal as well. I don't think you can take it uh, any other way. I mean, what goes on in your culture, your civilization, your community, in your being, in your sphere, <clears throat> it, it directly influences you. And, and it, did, it did here. Well, the show is also about power. Who has it? How is it abused? How can art transcend?
can it be grounded in morality and truth? We're facing a moral reckoning. How does art, this art, convey deep truths? Charmaine? I've always seen artists um, as observers and mirrors to their society. I think they really reflect whatever the medium is, whether it be music, poetry, writing, visual, uh, reflecting back their own times. So in that role as observer, I have turned the mirror back on what I'm seeing and feeling and sensing in our culture at this time. Um, but in, within our country, the, power have, uh, the people have the power. That's how we originated. That's our ethic that we built upon. And it drifts away from time to time, and we come to clash, and um, bring, we need to bring it back to the center. James, could, what, could you talk about that deeper truth coming from you personally and your art? Well, I can't talk about it in any other terms other than personal, to tell you the truth. Uh, <clears throat> I say that based on the male-female evolutionary history, really, you know, that there is a dynamic uh, there that is inherent. And boy, I'm a male, I'm a, I have seven daughters, I'm surrounded by females, you know, the female sensibility, uh, it comes to play in my in my thinking you know in terms of how i want to be how i want to be seen how i want to act how and i think the i think the male has a lot to be responsible for i think living up to our responsibility as a male uh, I, think, I think we really need to kind of question as to whether or not we are actually doing that you know and the piece in there called cockfight, you know, it's about, okay, it's a rooster, it's roosters, but man, men are fighting the roosters, you know, so it's an extension of themselves into and through that act of having these two things fight each other. Uh, sure, it's a metaphor for something, you know, but I think about those kinds of things and how you write them, how you level them, how you bring them onto what I call the the ball joint of living, the balance point, you know, of of living. It gets out of whack so easily. Uh, the the power mm -hmm. struggle, you know, it's power's mistaken a lot of times for something other, something that's really not that valuable. What is chaos and mayhem saying about life in going into 2021, about good versus evil, what it means to be human, how culture and society have been molded by war and aggression? Is it in our bones? James, you, you use bone in, in your title. So could you, each of you, talk about specific works and maybe describe those issues in? Go ahead. Go ahead, James. Well, it is in our bones. It's in our DNA. I mean, it, I mean, it is, you know, lions and tigers and bears don't really go around plotting things. You know, they don't go around, you know, conceptualizing on how to do things that are, that others can consider horrible. You know, mm -hmm. humans do. Mm -hmm. So it is, it, is in our, um, it is in our DNA, <clears throat> that negative and positive, the rise and the fall and the, you know, the so-called good and evil. There are those who espouse the reality that it's not good and evil, that very, very few are truly evil in that sense. There's, that's a very small number of us. But it's like a good versus a good. One good believes this and one good believes this and the two goods can't really you know, uh, meld theirs in. I, I, I did a, 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 one of the prints in here, it's called Father Rabbi. You know, it's a father and it's a rabbi. Uh, two major religions that are not that far apart. I mean, they are, my God, if you listen to them, they're a million miles apart. But I don't consider them that far apart, you know, but there are goods that fight other goods. 
And then you're, if you believe, I believe my good is so good, I'll kill you because your good is bad. It's, it, it's a strange thing humans do, you know, to have that kind of uh, meeting of madness, you know, and, and that's really what it is. And I think we're also talking about the political and the religious. They're both intertwined, inextricable in many, many ways. And James, I know you were brought up as a, a, a Texas Baptist. However, in this work, you're pushing against that. You're, you're bringing up those contradictions. Um, you've got a, a new work here called Bloodbone that many people will look upon as shamelessly erotic. But there are also religious underpinnings in that work, as well as maybe comments on an ancient flow between male and female. Well, it's definitely a male and female, and, and it is erotic. If you wanted to look at it as in that sense, yes, it, it, it is all of those things, you know. Uh, how is it connected to religion in any kind of way? Well, that's a real good question. I, I changed its title. Originally, I called it Church Fan, and I kind of reconstructed my thinking about it and, and moved it into some other realm. You know, the blood bone is part of the DNA. That's, that's part of the, the extension of that, what I would call that power. Um, you know, I don't know that males didn't have to have some kind of sense of power just for survival. You know, that strength or power, or, you know, that prowessness that you could hold, that's a, that's a powerful, powerful force. And it's come to bear, in, in, particularly in the man world. I, I used to think that women didn't really do those kinds of things, but now I think probably they do. You know, I, I've changed my mind. I think women can be just as stupid as men, you know, if you wanted to put it on that level. Um, that wasn't, I, I didn't used to think that. You know, I, I thought that just in a, in a metaphoric sense that the giver and the taker, the male and the female, you know, that there was kind of a, a, a balance there somehow that kept us in check, you know. Um, maybe we used to be on the uh, food chain, you know, and maybe, listen, businessmen, I swear, they love to do a deal, a, a deal. A deal is like the kill. Mm -hmm. You know, they want the hunter comes home from the hill and the businessman comes home from the deal. Mm -hmm. You know, and excuse me, businessmen. <laughs> you know, males do that. And this this exhibition I think has in and from my perspective some pretty deep questions about. And what about the deep questioning of religion in here? I mean, it's right there with falling steeple and double cross. Well, it's there in that red devil down there too of Charmaine's. Uh, you know, that... Uh, tell us about that one first. Well, Charmaine, I, I wanted to ask you, if, if we're talking about good versus evil, and is it in our bones? All right, and the political and religious inextricably intertwined. You've got not only unholy warrior, but also the whitewashing of truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, on both sides of the, on, on either, all the walls here, you're addressing those front and center. This is a tumultuous time, a very disorienting time, and so the wind reaped the whirlwind, another, drawing created in the middle of the year really touches on that in a almost biblical sense. The, these are mythic subjects, mythic drawings, ultimate struggles of life. Yes, good and evil. Um, I hesitate to phrase it in those terms, but it e exists in all of us. And so what, how do the times release that part of ourselves? I look to human flourishing as the ultimate goal of societies, of humans within the society, an aspirational sense, tolerance of each other, equality and justice for all, the foundations of this country, 
that are now being so shaken. I'm just appalled and yes, seeing that I felt it last year. I saw the beginnings and saw the the ripples of it start and saying, no, no, we can't go that way. We have to come together and find a way to put a force field around this, this antipathy, antipathy to each other and finding the negative and the flaws and the things where we're opposite and bring us back to uh, a level ground. So, yes, there's um, truth. Yes, I'm trying to address the truth in the whitewashing of the truth drawing. Things that go on within our culture, not just around the world, the human condition and how it suffers at the hands of those seeking power. Can you describe that drawing? It is five hooded figures with red, brilliant red, crimson red crosses on the front and four black figures hanging by their feet that have, it's a very tough drawing. It's very difficult to look and to conceive of humans going there. People that have been burned alive, people that have been hung for their color, for their ethnic and racial composition and beings. We have to stop and be aware, become aware, be thoughtful, and fight these instincts. They're instincts, you know. How did this work begin? Um, I, I'd like for both of you to talk about your sources and influences. Um, Charmaine, I, you and I have been talking about even thinking in terms of medieval sources in this work in terms of instruction and, and guidance. Um, who else? Who else were you looking at? I dove into a lot of sources that I was familiar with, and then as I went through doing some research, became more familiar with um, a couple who had documented Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Having lived in Okinawa in 1952, just very shortly after that, four years, a little more than that, um, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, putting yourself in someone else's position to imagine being there at that time. This couple portrayed the residue of those moments, just raw, gritty, tough subject matter. But we did that, and we don't want to do it again. That's where I come down on it. We want to stop that move look at ourselves carefully. Uh, you've also mentioned Leon Golub and Nancy Sparrow, mm -hmm. um, figurative expressionists. Uh, Leon Golub, of course, was very well known out in the forefront in the early 80s for his mercenaries and interrogator series. Nancy Sparrow was uh, producing very detailed, astonishing works dealing with uh, anti-war anti anti and also uh, women as victims. Yeah. Did you look at that work? At yes, I was familiar with it, but I did dive in and was um, amazed to see the same red tones used to portray that emotional connection that we have and to bring it forth and the color of blood. I mean, it. this is in our bloodstream. James uses the analogy of the bone. I use the analogy of the blood and the carried in the DNA. And it brings forth emotions of positive and negative, positive passion for life and uh, giving. And on the other hand, taking, taking and reducing down. When you reduce down, you reduce the possibilities. You you just, people are drawing this backward instead of attaining these high goals that our culture and world really had um, come close to achieving. James, could you talk about your influences, what you've been thinking, looking at in terms of this new work? Yes, I will. <clears throat> but I, I would like to back up just mm -hmm. for just for the sake of doing it, I guess. but. 
there's two m moments in art, two artists, uh, Joseph Cornell and Terry Allen. Mm -hmm. Joseph Cornell dropped a marble in a shot glass and in essence showed us the universe uh, by doing that. I mean, it was that significant and that insignificant as just simply dropping a marble in a shot glass in a, in a little sculpture. I, I, I saw that and I just meant I was just engulfed with the kind of the freedom of a moment, a single moment of doing an, of make, doing an act. Terry Allen did a piece, I don't even remember when, back in the late 70s or mid 70s or something, over in Fort Worth where he did a, a, a rodeo piece. It was a big rodeo show over there. And Terry Allen had a, a I guess you would say a, a pretty big tableau of some sort. Uh, and I guess you'd call it installation art. But I went through and saw it. And he had a dresser, a dresser, just like a dresser you'd have in a bedroom. You know, we'd, the men call them the dresser drawers. Okay, here's the dresser. On the dresser, he had things out of his pocket. Keys, some change, a couple of nuts and bolts. He, you know, he had his wallet laying there. He'd, he'd emptied his pockets and laid all the stuff out on the dresser drawer. And I remember looking at it and thinking of it as, boy, what a simple one moment act. Just that, that act. You know, it's almost like Picasso putting his bread hands a single act that just carries so much power and so much weight. Mm -hmm. And I think artists by nature want to aspire to that moment in terms of what's important around them, what's important in that moment in their life. And I, I believe that Charmaine and I both are receptive. We're very receptive, you know, to thoughts of magnitude uh, coming through us. Now, all humans have that ability, you know. Uh, I don't know how many can exercise it in terms of showing some kind of creative form for those things of what they see. But this, this has been, this show has been, in the last year, has been, there's been a lot of conversation devoted to meaning and content mm -hmm. and you know putting putting this together i like the idea of having a sculpture that in suggests you know that it's like five million years old i mean the mm -hmm. the the piece of stone between you know the dark bone and the eyes and the thorns there's a, a stone in there that's a you know, it's a petrified stone from millions and millions of years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, our art covers a vast, vast distance as well as that little singular moment. And I think we aspire, both of us, I think, aspire to, to, to that. I mean, Charmaine's work literally takes us back hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of years. You know, it harkens back to kind of almost like the very beginning of the rise and fall of civilizations. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that, it's sort of that ancient in terms of its being. But it also is of right now, it's of this moment. I went in earlier and I put my face up close to them and it was almost like looking into an aquarium. You know, I was looking into a, another universe, another world. It was like looking and watching things swim around and oh this was alive and that's alive Th that, that art is just literally alive with forms and detail mm -hmm. and messages uh, and bursts and bubbles and uh, wind and whip and force and gravity um, it does speak of what's going on around us Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, getting back to your specific works for this exhibition, there are more wood sculptures. So what, what was going on in terms of 
the pandemic or you're or in the studio that well you were going I, I, back to I'm work. gonna I'm gonna answer that in two ways one way is just has to do with kind of the flow of the studio and one way has to do with exercising a, a, a specific desire okay the flow of the studio has it that I've made some very big bronze stainless steel welded monumental go zone trucks with cranes and you know they occupy the studio and they're really based around a specific kind of process over on the other side of the room is my work tables plural there's more than one there's piles of wood there's things that I have collected, ideas that I have that I want to exercise. So I've got two different phenomenons going on in the studio. The one over at my work table, no one else can do that. I, that's, that's not an inv something that an assistant can be involved in. You know, they can't come carve your pieces. They can't come chop your wood. You know, they can't come and rasp and hone and build and mold and make and glue. And they can't do all that stuff. They can weld. Okay, so they can work over on the fabrication side of the studio. I have really had a desire for the past year and a half to, to really start to gel in that half of my studio that had to do with me on a personal level at the work table. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so I kind of went back to what got me to the ball game in the first place, which was wood me making wooden things which i'll brag a little i'm very good at you know i mean i i, I love doing that that kind of work uh, i love shaping those forms and drilling and gluing and you know doing I, I love doing working like that so and if you're going to work like that the question is is what are you going to make mm -hmm. you know i make things we both did in this case, and, and, and I guess I always have, but I, I made things from my conscious, from my conscious and subconscious, and I made stuff from me. I didn't look outside of me in terms of uh, sort of what you'd call the geometric world. Uh, and boy, I've devoted a lot of time in the last year to the, what I call sort of a, a sense of shame the, the fallen steeple, mm -hmm. a steeple that's falling. I mean, my God, think about it. What is a steeple? It's a sense, it's a, it's a visual testimony to, a, to ascension. You know, it, it, it's aspiring, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's aspiring, it's looking upward, it's pointing to the skies. You know, it's giving us some kind of glory in a sense, at least that's the, that's the stated purpose and the psychological purpose of it. I think we have to bring some things in the religious world to, to, to task right now. I think we need to ask them some questions. What are you doing and why are you doing it? You know, I mean, are you really living up to, I mean, keep in mind when I was in Sunday school, it was red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're all precious. Jesus loves you. Ooh, Jesus loves everybody. Well, does he? Mm -hmm. You know, does he really? Are you as the church showing that he really does? Or are you just saying that in the Sunday school class? You know, we, I mean, it's, it's, it's time to kind of, you know, fess up. It's, it's time right now. It's time for us to state where we are as a community. I also want to ask, what meaning does art have, especially sculpture, as form, volume, weight, in the time of living in, in the iCloud? Um, over the past several months, we've been scrolling, enlarging on our iPhones and iPads, but this exhibition in the gallery requires physical engagement pushing the viewer out of a comfort zone, uh, walking around the work, negotiating with it, navigating it, uh, the textures of the wood, the stone, uh, Charmaine, your blood red force fields. Uh, we were just commenting that 
um, on, for example, on the internet, you cannot see the, the buildup, the, the material uh, layered on the paper. Up close, it becomes crystalline or like scabs or wounds. So we're talking about being active or passive viewers. I'd, I'd like your opinions on that. Charmaine, can you start? We, we have this discussion with artist friends all the time about are we becoming dinosaurs? Are we moving into a period where, well, we have been through a period where there's less emphasis on the physicality. And now with 3D printing and many other technological advances and the screens and it is a challenge and uh, we'll be facing it for a long time. But I think there will always be people in our culture who love the tactile nature, the one-to-one -one raw uh, give and take that the viewer has with the physicality of the art, the three-dimensional quality of walking around and absorbing through your skin and your senses what the artist has produced with their hands. So that completes the cycle. You know, from mind, spirit, hand, to the finished product, and then the viewer repeats that process and absorbs it. It's like eating. It's a, pulling in this body of information. Artists are translating information uh, from their psyche to another psyche, and we want people to c come look, respond, sometimes not feeding, you know, receiving the same information that we put in. They have a different interpretation due to their life experiences. But their, the cycle is complete when there is viewership and shared, shared information. Can so, you talk about the process on your, on your drawings? Uh, that la multi-layering process that, like I was mentioning, mm -hmm. is crystalline or kind of like a scabrous wound. You've also got very delicate, fragile areas, diaphanous, and then some just spiraling scatters, splatters, <laughs> and violent strokes. As I sat at the work table and spent time, just spent time moving through those emotions and cycling through thoughts of what I was addressing. The physicality of the drawing piled up. I do start with a uh, wax or a substance that resists, so it creates those uh, initial layers that become transparent and translucent and then building with the soda, baking soda, and salt, elements of life. We're made of salt, we have salt in us, uh, basic elements. Um, I chose to let those absorb the oil, uh, the paint, and become thicker substances that translated the objects within. So they took on a life of their own, literally. Um, and then that play back and forth with the um, thinner elements, the see-through elements, and then those thicker, it created a real dynamic. Um, and the splatters, of course, were essential to communicating the diabolical. You know, that's one thing that I'm addressing in this, is that drive for destruction and the conflict that's inevitable. James, what do you think about, in terms of active versus passive viewing, what the internet has done? I mean, it's done wonderful things, but it does change how we look at art. Uh, for example, cockfight, if you look at that on the internet, it, the scale is much, very much changed versus being with it, this beast, this creature in person, walking around it, smelling the wood, looking at the texture. So what is, what is your take on this? Well, look, we're, I think we're on the cusp and have been for the, maybe since the turn of this last century, 20-something years ago, 
you know, the difference in the physical and the digital, or and I guess digital is considered physical too, you know, but nevertheless, I, I still use a rasp, I still use a hatchet, I still use a, a saw, you know, I use a chisel, I use a hammer, I use a maul, I use a wedge, I split, I, I do all of these physical things. It's a it's a one to one ratio between the eye, the hand, and the piece of, and the thing you're working on. I I have a hard time uh, looking v via the digital world, you know. And my assistant Ty so gracefully tells me, James, that train's left the station. You know, it's done. It's that page has been turned historically. We, we've, you know, well, in one sense, that leaves me as a physical producer, you know, kind of in an obsolete, almost obsolete kind of world. But the reality is, is that's just process. That's a technique. The, the, the computer or a chisel. Both of those things are just tools. You know, it's what you do with them that makes what is important. I'm not going to say you can't make important art, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the new paradigm of, of physically producing things. I'm still stuck in the old method of doing things, <clears throat> but I make things of consequence in terms of their concept and their meaning and their content. Psychologically, I think they cover a vast time, backwards and forwards. I think cockfight will be applicable 20 years from now. I think it'll be applicable 100 years from now. I think it very well may be applicable 1,000 years from now or ever how long it's somebody's gonna keep it oiled, you know, however how long it lasts. And I think therein lies the importance. It's, I mean, everybody uses paper. Tons of people use red and blue and yellow and Tons of people use circles and squares and triangles, you know. I mean, those, all, those, all those colors are out there for all of us. You know, all those techniques are out there for all of us. We, we all have, are privy mm -hmm. to those. It's what we do with them. You know, therein, it's the voice. It's the language. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's what you are saying that, that gives something its importance or not. I mean, there's tons of people that make art out of wood, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, I mean. Which brings me to ask, how do you want the viewer to connect with this work, Charmaine? <clears throat> well, I have a hard time <laughs> imagining it taking place over the computer. I, I do hope that viewers will come and be in this space with it and take it all in, the totality of the exhibit, the dialogue between James's pieces and mine, they do reverberate with each other. Mm -hmm. We don't work in the same materials, the same scale, the same uh, many things, but we do work from the same philosophical pool. We draw from similar concepts that we share and have for many, many years. Um, conversations of what art is and how it moves forward into this new era. Um, so I, I really think that the physical presence, which not everyone can do, and particularly right now, we're still in lockdown or socially distanced times, but I encourage people to come and make an appointment perhaps, or be here physically with the work to look and absorb and, and you know start that thought process going of, how we can change the dynamics moving mm -hmm. forward. James, what kind of communion would you hope for between the work and the viewer? Well, when I said a while ago that I got up close to Charmaine's and looked and looked right face to face, eye to eye, right there with it, and said it was it was like looking into an aquarium. That's like saying it was like looking into an ocean. You know, people can look at something and they still not see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did a piece once called Look and See. You can look, but you cannot see. Sometimes you can look and you know, look around and well, what did you see? Oh, well, I don't know. You know, you, you weren't really seeing and hearing is the same way. I want people to look at it. 
I, I, I love it when people look at my art. But I can tell you, I have seen over and over and over and over again, uh, standing in, a, in the, the, the main big room of a museum, that people kind of meander. A lot of times they're not, they're not really looking hard. You know, Charmaine, my God, Charmaine spent an hour and a half on, on two <laughs> paintings. You know, uh, I can't, but I do look. And looking is really, I want them to look and see it, and it will be different. It, it will be different. When they're face to face with it, it's different. It's not the same. Um, yeah, I want them to really look, look at it. So what is the responsibility of artists to guide us, especially through this transitional world that we're in, divisive world? What's their responsibility as active change agents? Well, uh, we all look to music to guide us. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's a um, primary source for all of us, whatever variety of music you choose. I think the words, the lyrics, the music, pulse, beat, instruments add so much to that information that's coming through. Um, this is another modality, but <clears throat> visual artists have a different <coughs> techniques. Um, I'm going to pass it to you. <laughs> well, it's like the singing Neanderthal. You know, I mean, the rhymes, the rhythms, and the patterns that that uh, that we develop. You know, uh, what was the question? Can artists? guide us as active change agents well they should i mean that i think that's part of the i think that's part of the goal there's a big argument about that and particularly in the sort of the, the through the 50s and the 60s and uh, of, of when i was a kid and around <clears throat> there are those who said well art can be anything you want it to be you know well they would look at something and if you could look at it and you didn't know what it was and the person you were with said, well, it just can be anything. It's your interpretation. Well, okay, great. You know, you can interpret and paste your vision on it, and you can bring to the table as spectator all you want to, but I think art should give you a handle. It should give you a path. It should give you a directive. You know, it's saying, here, this is what it is, and that's back to that business about truth, about, you know, what is, what is truth in in all of this. Artists do represent a, a particular truth. You know, I mean, I could go back and tell you a dozen artists who I was not necessarily fond of their art, you know, but I, I believed them, you know. I believed in what they saw, you know, and I, I think you, you, really, you really have to give truth uh, some, some room in there. I had a curator once when, on, on this subject said, truth, truth, whose truth, what truth, what truth are you talking about, James? You know, and I said, well, I'm talking about mine, my truth, the truth that I see. This is the honest vision that I have on this particular subject. Now, if you want to interpret it off into some distant place, that's fine. There's nothing I can do about that. But I do have an intent, you know. I do want to be a change agent in that sense, you know. I, I do want to give them a path, a direction, a handle. Uh, well, that's being a guide, a psychic guide in poetry and literature of all forms guides us through the words and through the medium so well we're, we're shining the light out there into the future and clearing the path i i believe that i think you're right i i mean i i remember a period in my life where i was sort of enchanted with the concept of a spirit guide a spirit guide what you know when all is down and it's it's you on you who do you talk to? 
in, in, in that moment. And I think that's where spirit guides actually do come into play and do give you some good advice. And, and it may very well be, I concluded, you talking to you. It's, it's like body knowing. You know, you know, your, your intuitive self will rise and tell you something, you know, that you, that you, really, you really know, but you let it come out. What sustains both of you as, as artists? Uh, you, you met at SMU over 45 years ago. James, you were professor of sculpture. Charmaine, you were a senior student in psychology and sociology. But this is the first time you've shown together in Dallas in, in over 45 years. It brings to mind other partners in the art world, in marriage, in life. There's Diego and Frida. There's Jackson Pollock, Lee Krasner, Leon Golub, Nancy Sparrow. In most cases, that one tends to suck all the air out of the room. Here, at this moment, for this exhibition, you're neck and neck. You're like two racehorses right out of the gate at full speed. One does not dominate the other. Can you comment about that? Well, it's been a long run <laughs> to get to that point. And it's not a competition. It's, um, we, we each do what we do throughout the day and follow our own guide out there and follow our own path um, and share, share those mutual inspirations and um, family moments. I mean, that is so important in and our in life together. And insecurities as well, I would, I would guess. Possibly. You know, all of that, <laughs> yeah. Sure. Trust yourself, sure. doubt yourself. <gasps> yeah. Um, but the guiding light is the art and getting back to it. And mine is sporadic and not uh, as complete from time to time. There's holes in it, but it always continues and I come back to it and I'm persistent in that. So this uh, is a period in my life where at this age, I'm in my children's ages, grown adults, that now I can really focus and give it all. And um, very pleased about that. Well, I would like to say I don't consider that at our core there has ever been anything other than equality. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I will tell you, <clears throat> uh, I don't doubt. I, I have total confidence. Uh, I may or may not be able to suck any oxygen out of any given space. I'm, I, don't, I don't really know about that. But I'm very, very secure uh, in what I do, and I'm very opinionated. And in all fairness to the person I love most in the whole world, she will tell me from time to time, James, you really don't know everything, <laughs> you know. And I, you know, I would like to think that I can act accordingly, you know, that uh, I, I can tell you there, in my mind, there is balance at our core, you know, and I think that's very, very important. After six decades, nearly six decades of making art, what are you searching for at this stage in the latter third of your lives and careers? What's the through line, Charmaine? My commitment is to this um, path to peace, which I've touched on throughout um, at different times through different pieces. Um, I do tend to go towards healing this is a different side of the coin that I've chosen to come at it, but previously it was from a lighter stance. Now I'm digging in. James? Well, you're being very generous when you say the last third. I hope <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty good in my case. We well, we're all seniors here, yeah, so I just... <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say I may be a little bit older than the rest of you, but... Uh, Nevertheless, I, I am very, very happy just to simply have my hands. I've, I still have my hands, you know, my, I mean, my, my mind wanders, but I still have it, you know. And uh, I'm very excited about new pieces of art. There's quite a few pieces on the table right now that I've started, you know, that 
The question really is, is my God, when you have one on the table that weighs 2,000 2, pounds, you know, then you, then you got to really question. Um, well, I guess I'm also talk, talking in terms of um, age being also brings wisdom. All right, this kind of exhibition could not have been attempted by a younger artist, all right? Not only does it take decades of risk and rejection and trust yourself, doubt yourself, but also of life experience. And I think that's what I was getting at. In terms of what you've seen, experienced, felt, uh, gone through, um, even from your move from Splendora to Colorado and coming back to Splendora, all of those things accrued over a lifetime, I think, enters into this body of work. I think that's why James's tabletop drawing is so appealing, because there are the marks and the, the slashes and chainsaw and not on a metal, metal table, but rasps and mechanical devices that have made their mark. And we all take our marks and take our experiences, and um, why not translate it out? And, and put it out there as um, evidence of our passage and our experiences. I was started in Massachusetts, went to California, to Okinawa, back to Boston, Washington, D.C. I've traveled the world and absorbed different cultures and the way people live, and that's an influence in my life that comes through of this is not the only way. Mine is not the only way. We have um, vast experiences to translate to people, and this is one avenue, so. And James, uh, much of your experience echoes back to the fence posts, probably from Well, childhood. when she was traveling around the world, I was digging post holes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I grew up on the rural route. I, I, I kind of lived in and around and about a, you know, a particular little region in East Texas. and. Uh, got out, got out. Did I get out? I don't. I don't know that I got out. I my my mind got out. You know, my physical world is still pretty much tied to that that origin. You know, I mean, it's a lot of my the processes of my art came from that. Just it just you know, I, it's almost like you are a product of of a particular birth. Well, that concludes our discussion. Thank you, Charmaine and James, for your candid and very thoughtful responses. And thank all of you for watching. And please come see this landmark exhibition, Chaos and Mayhem, on view through April 3rd at Kirk Hopper Fine Art in Dallas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susie.